Nation's Trust Bank Private Banking is the epitome of elite banking. With its exclusive privileges devoted to providing just the right balance between financial success and lifestyle, our private banking members richly deserve. A financial solution dedicated to excellence. With an unparalleled array of products and services that enrich, enhance and empower success. A financial solution focused on wealth creation, lifestyle and the establishment of legacy. A legacy of priority, a legacy of abundance, a legacy much desired. Creating a legacy that's timeless. It actually amazes me how how interested people are in an animal like the leopard. And a good indication is to just look at all of you who have come here to listen to a talk on leopards. And I think that is where our strength lies for conservation, especially as you know, we are saying we are getting into the Anthropocene where more and more lands are not available for wildlife. What do they do then? You know, they have to live among people and then it is up to people like us to ensure that problems are minimized for both the people and the animals. At least that's what I have learned. And also what I learned when I started working on the leopards, I was a wildlife biologist. So I went in only with the animal in my focus. The leopard taught me to unlearn a lot of things I had learned. And I think it's really important we do that because it, it pushes the boundaries of what you think is right and wrong. Just, I mean, this is an artwork, but it shows like the leopards at the edge of the Sanjay Gandhi National Park in Bombay. And, you know, one would look at that and say, that's not normal, but it's not normal by our definition, by the leopard's definition. She goes there, she hunts her dogs and pigs, and she feeds her babies, you know, that's okay with her. So I think often we put our sense of morality on the animal and sometimes that's really bad because what happened was earlier when we did that, we said, oh, these leopards should not be in cropland. Let's pick them up and put them back in the forest. We actually created a far greater problem with human attacks near the release sites by animals which had otherwise lived among people eating only dogs and goats. So it's very important that we do not put what we want them to do on them because they are at the end of the day potentially dangerous animals and they can worsen our actions can worsen the problem so i would just like to go over some myths uh, you know about the leopards which i found as part of my work that they always cause conflict okay that they are bloodthirsty now look at this it was a media headline bloodthirsty leopard rescued alive it's one really frightened young animal okay and if you read the article the rescue team says that they did not have the proper equipment and the drugs to handle the situation and it landed up injuring six people it was not because it wanted to injure it was because we couldn't handle the situation well yeah so that leopards always means attacks on people you know that they are solitary and you know, often even we think that only a man-eater will get headlines. A normal leopard not doing anything will not get headlines. That also is a myth. So what we find as part of our work, our leopards are terrified of people. Because if you see, we are their, actually their predators. We kill, we kill without a reason. Yeah. Yep. And they, what we also find through our work, in both rural landscape as well as in the peri-urban landscape, like the areas right near the national park, is they can live so close to people without any attacks. They are not solitary. They have societies. Societies are built around the females, the mothers, daughters, sisters. Their cubs all live close by. And what we also found, much to our surprise, is that media likes to report even positive news even when there is no conflict. And we should all take, uh, you know, seize that chance because 
only reading negative news is also not good for, both for the species and for the situation. So although we don't have, it's a lovely uh, little scientific uh, study that was done of mountain lions in the US. They are the same size as leopards. They also come close to houses, eat dogs and cats. But just see what they show. So they play the video of a human voice. This is not good for the country, what's happening here, because it isn't, I don't think, full. So they don't even stop to see if they are humans or not, they just hear the sound and they go. Um, and that impacts their feeding, you know, it impacts a lot of things. It's not just pumas, they did a really nice study even with the bears in Sweden, similar work where the researchers actually went towards the radio collared bears and in every instant the bears moved away, you know, so. Um, yeah, so leopards rarely show themselves, so that's why we don't understand much about them. We cannot study much about them, but there are a couple of places in India, in Rajasthan, where leopards show themselves. I don't know if you can see, but there are like one, two, three, four, five leopards in the brown image, and uh, you know, and there's a leopard sitting above the temple in the gray image. Now, these landscapes are actually sacred and people don't harm any living thing in these rocky areas. This is not a protected area. They're people's livestock, they're people's high density of people, and the leopards are there. But, but here, because they show themselves, you can see a lot of leopards together. And they do have societies, yeah? And another thing, if you realize, nearly two years or so of her life, the mother lives with one bunch of cubs. And if you look at proportionately how much time we spend with our children, like we live up, you know, maybe to 60, 70, and nearly 15, 16 years, our children are with us. If you do that proportion, it's almost the same time the mother spends of her lifetime with each litter, teaching them how to survive. And there's a lot of maternal bonding. And you know, where I work in the rural landscape, they have sugarcane fields, so they cut it. When they cut the sugar cane, they find leopard cubs. And now, earlier they didn't know what to do with it, but now they go back and they release them. And the mother comes and takes them away. So this is just a video to show. You can see the sugar cane crop at the back. Because she doesn't get any, she, she has no nanny to take care of the cubs while she goes to hunt, so she has to leave them, yeah. That sound is the cub making. So, so we had a lot of media workshops in Bombay, you know, in collaboration with the Mumbai Press Club as well as the Marathi Press Club. And we didn't, we just did it, it was organic, but when we analyzed the headings before and after the workshop, we found that there is a big difference, and I don't know if you all can read it because my eyes are old, but I'm going to read it out to you. So the results found that despite fewer attacks in our post-workshop time frame, reporting about leopards actually increased. So there wasn't any problem, but the, ray, the number of articles were much more because they're interested. Everybody's interested in this cat. Also, the coverage was less sensational and leopards were not portrayed as an aggressor post-workshops. Emphasis was placed how humans can prevent attacks and more realistic solutions 
were presented. So therefore, it is really important to engage with the media because they can be huge allies in this conservation work. Yeah. So for instance, earlier they would just show leopards with their fangs barred, but you know, afterwards, a leopard, you can see it sitting on the, on the balcony of somebody's house. And then the rescue team went there with the volunteers and just explained to them and put up camera traps, told them what to do, what not to do. There was garbage at their gate. So they helped the forest department write a letter to the municipality asking them to clean the garbage. And the media reported it in a very neutral, scared Royal Palm residents learn to live with leopards. And the do's and don'ts are given over there. So like even an incident like a leopard seen on the sitting on the balcony can turn into a positive news report. And more and more such news reports which help people understand how to live with this animal is super important. So this is the landscape where I started working. As you can see, there's no protected area there. They are all croplands. And I, I, you all may remember this video. Maybe you all have seen him. But I've seen it more than maybe a thousand times. But each time I love seeing it, so I'm just going to play it for you. So the leopard has fallen in a percolation well, and they put this bamboo frame for it to sit on. Behind are all onion fields and corn fields. And people are just curious. And they've covered it with thorny bushes so that he goes into the cage. So, a couple of questions. <laughs> Which, which I like to ask is, does the leopard realize that humans have saved him? Okay. And the uh, other, que other point is, he obviously knows what a trap cage is, right? So, and some of the findings in like the 200 square kilometer landscape I worked were there, there were no human deaths due to leopards, although there was a high density of leopards. There's no wild prey there. It's all dogs and goats and calves and you know, so 40% of the prey was dogs, domestic dogs. And what we found is just if you look at the density of dogs and cats, it's enough to sustain the existing leopard population over there. Yeah. And not much was done to catch the leopards or anything, and very, very few translocations. Is this conflict? Right? So we have to be very careful when we use the term conflict, because conflict is like a war. You know, and these animals are not purposely doing what they are doing. So we've, we've moved away, like Inoka and I also had the discussion, we moved away from using conflict to more like interactions. And when there is damages, that is livestock is lost, then you call it a damage. But to call it a conflict really inflates the issue. So we did some collaring in the rural landscape. This lady has buried a pig at the back. And just like this is entirely, there's no protected area in this. The green that you see, the contiguous green is cropland along the river valleys. And the brown are the dry landscapes. And this was the animal's home range. Yeah, the same lady in the earlier picture. And this is where she lived. And you can see the clusters. Those were where she sat in the daytime. And all those single points in the, village, in the town was where she went in the night. So my question is, whose land is it? Right? And then there was this other 
elderly leopard. He walked, uh, I, I, so he started walking uh, near that water body and he walked 125 kilometers in 25 days and went to Bombay. You know, he crossed a highway, a railway station, he crossed three protected areas and he lived there for two years till he was found dead, hit in a vehicle accident. So you can see, I don't know if you can, but in the middle of that industrial estate, there is one location of his which had us all really worried, but he didn't do anything to anybody. He swam across the creek. All those red points are his collar points. And he went to the main national park and he swam back and he swam around, you know, this distance. So leopards also adapt, humans also adapt. And one of the uh, traditional me methods is livestock sheds. We may think of it as low tech, but this is centuries old of protecting livestock against carnivores. And in India, right from Himalayas to the semi-arid landscapes in the south where people have a lot of sheep and they migrate, their dogs wear collars, those spiked collars to prevent uh, leopards and wolves from attacking them. This is in the Himalayas, that's why the dog is so fluffy and you know he's got a big collar. So what we found is nearly 70% of the farmers in our landscape have good predator-proof sheds. They are made by themselves. So this, this one on the top, when I first visited him, I visited him because he had lost a goat to the leopard. After one year when I visited him, he had made a simple chain link fence by himself. They are aware that leopards have been around and shepherds use dogs as early warning system. So I'm now going to go to the urban leopards of Mumbai. The Sanjay Gandhi National Park in Mumbai is a unique national park situated within the municipal limits of Mumbai, suburban Mumbai, Vasai Virar, Meera Bhainder and Thane districts. It is one amongst the few national parks in India which has a maximum number of tourists visiting it. SCNP is also known for the highest density of leopards it supports. Okay, there seems to be some So what I'm doing here is I'm setting a small camera trap which is going to take me close to the secret life of leopards. As the sun goes down, activity in the forest increases. The night heron, the small Indian civet, all sorts of animals start moving out in search of food. And so does the leopard. They prefer to hunt in the night's darkness when human activity is low. The forests of SCNP show presence of prey in all shapes and sizes, ranging from the Hanuman langurs to the common mongoose, the barking deer. We also have the beautiful spotted deer, commonly known as the cheetal. And the largest of all, sambar deer. When on a hunt, nothing can distract a leopard. Our research shows that wild prey contribute to 57% of the leopard's diet. The remaining 43% is represented by the domestic prey. Domestic or free-ranging dogs show the highest single species contribution in the leopard's diet. After the leopard has spent a busy night of marking and maintaining territories and roaming in search of food, Dawn finds the leopard tired and sleepy. The daytime is usually spent sleeping and resting on treetops, dry stream beds or cool rocky caves like this one. Once the leopards have found a mate for the season, the next couple of days are spent in courtship and short duration intercourses at regular intervals. The wild growl given by the leopards can be considered as a gesture of love towards each other. After a short gestation period of approximately 3 months, the female gives birth to a litter of 2 to 3 cubs. 
These cubs spend about 18 to 24 months with their mother learning survival skills and then venture out by themselves looking for their own territories. On a couple of occasions, we found leopards and people getting photographed in the same camera trap. And this was not only on forest trails, but also on trails next to their own houses. When I joined this uh, national park as its director a year back, I was amazed as to the close proximity in which leopards and humankind lived here. In fact, I wanted to learn more about it. In this video, you see a leopard next to a house drinking water peacefully. At the very next moment, you see him running away. And the reason for running becomes crystal clear when the window opens and two heads pop out. Leopards tend to run away at the sight of humans. This big cat has adapted itself very well to the city life. They visit human settlements in search of easy prey, but avoid humans at the same time. The leopards have acquired the art of living with humans by avoiding confrontation with them. It's our turn now to learn the art of living with leopards. So just last two years, we collared uh, five leopards in, in uh, Mumbai. And uh, you can see how much he respects our work because he's spraying our cage. <laughs> and uh, it was really interesting. Uh, this was done in COVID time because otherwise our permissions would have run out. And each color, uh, you know, starting with red at the bottom and then purple and then you know, pink and blue, these are all the home ranges of the leopards. The larger leopards, larger home ranges are of the males and the smaller home ranges are of the females. And uh, we found that it's a very small home ranges for the females, 3 to 13 square kilometers and 23 to 84 for males. And uh, we've the collared animals prey, you know, we would go the next day and check what they were doing at their sites and all, and then we'd find their kills. So we found that 80% uh, of those kills, it was domestic prey. And they love to sit in these rocky areas. Here, this is a lovely video. She used to come out and check if there were people walking on the path near her. Here she's not checking. I have another video where she comes and actually hears people and then comes out and checks. And an uh, important thing that the park manager wanted us to do is to try and find out where the leopards cross the highways. So we had uh, put some camera traps in some of those locations because a lot of road expansion is taking place. So this was one place you can see our camera trap and you know that's where our collared leopard used to cross. So it was an important management recommendation to give to the forest department. You can see all our collared females, three of them had cubs when they were collared and you can see she's carrying her cub in her mouth. And uh, if you ask me the success of any work or even conservation research work as well as conservation work it is collaborations and we worked you know include including all the forest staff and and the reason why i say that is because it also in improves their knowledge and understanding when we are working when we include them in our work we also gain tremendously like the rescue because of the rescue team's expertise in trapping leopards we could immediately get all the leopards we want to trap. So I think we really underestimate the value of collaborations and our role in being a catalyst to increase knowledge in the other partners that are part of this. So I really enjoyed, our whole team really enjoyed working so closely with the forest department, veterinarians from other institutions, the local NGOs that were there. Um, and like, yeah, so there were a lot of uh, agencies involved 
And uh, uh, just before I show a short video, Bombay had very serious attacks on people. So you have to realize that it's the capital of Mumbai. All the press sits there. All the politicians sit there. So even one sighting of a leopard makes front news. So like May 2004, there were 19 attacks on people in that one month. So it was really bad. And the, the solution was seen as translocation, which only spread the problem. So when we, you know, the forest department also later on understood that translocations are creating a problem, but they told us, you know, we get political pressure, like somebody from these tall buildings nearby who is very rich calls people and then we are forced to put a trap cage. So then we realize we have to change the way people look at these leopards and for the, who can do that best but the media. So we did a lot of media uh, collaborations and there was this little project that was started by a very good officer in 2011 that was called Mumbai Curse for SGNP, which means the citizens of Bombay for Sanjay Gandhi National Park. And the, the, the crux of it was that we involve everybody. It was voluntarily, so there wasn't a lot of money and all. But there are people who want to work, like youngsters, you know, even uh, housewives, retired people, they all came on board. And this is a short project. And like I like to say, you know, it's very easy to create a problem. It's very easy to create a conflict. You have to work hard to maintain peace. Yeah. So it's the same with these animals. So the work has been going on. I am no longer part of it. That officer has also left. But tenuously, the people are still doing their work. It has spread, you know, to other aspects. Maybe it'll change. Maybe there'll be something that's done five years down the line and everything will roll back. But we don't have a choice. We have to just keep trying, I think. So Dawn unfurls a bustle of activity in Mumbai, a global city that attracts millions in search of fame and fortune. There's another face to India's financial capital, shadowed by popular impressions an island of ancient forests thrives within the heart of Mumbai. Sanjay Gandhi National Park A hundred square kilometer treasure trove of India's natural heritage, SGNP represents the greener extreme of Mumbai. But with 35 leopards in this oasis, surrounded by massive urban sprawl supporting around 21,000 people per square kilometer, leopard-human interactions are inevitable. In the past, fear prevailed over reason and leopards were blindly branded villains, captured and relocated, until scientists discovered that it did more harm than good. Now backed with scientific understanding and best traditional practices, a people's movement is taking shape. Mumbai is pioneering in our ever-shrinking world the art of coexisting peacefully with this adaptable predator. In a small hamlet inside SGNP, members of the indigenous Wali tribe prepare for their day. They have been living with leopards for as long as they can remember. What about their god lifting their poultry and livestock? So I just want to interrupt here. I don't know if that text was visible, but the Wadlis, like many other indigenous people across India, revere the large cats, including the leopard. So for them, it is their god. And, uh, you know, they don't mind it and they, un they have rituals around it and that helps, I think. Yet, they understand the potential risks and take precautions to keep themselves and their children safe. Not everyone is lucky to understand leopards as these tribes do. Residents outside SGNP panicked at even just a sighting. Enter Mumbai Curse for SGNP a multi-dimensional initiative to mitigate conflicts and help people live with leopards. That initiative came into being when the forest department and some of the researchers, scientists and the passionate volunteers decided to come together, study the whole 
scenario and then try to mitigate one by one all those issues. It was not an easy task. People's mindsets had to be changed from fear to understanding leopards. But with precedent set by tribes like Warlies, success was only a matter of time and approach. The Forest Department and Mumbaikers set about on four interconnected activities. The first was scientific research to understand leopards, their prey and interactions with people. Among other findings, the research revealed reasons for leopard presence outside the forest. So usually the uh, park would be blamed, you know, there's not enough prey in your park and there's a reason the leopards are coming out. I use line turns distance sampling to uh, know the uh, prey density. There was adequate prey. The only thing was there was more than adequate prey outside the park in terms of pigs, dogs majorly. The second activity was to build capacity of the forest department. Rescue team members were sensitized, trained and equipped for immediate response to leopard incidences, including tranquilization when necessary. Improved coordination between different divisions of the forest department ensured that all emergencies were effectively attended. The third activity was to develop constructive partnerships. Coordination with the municipal corporation to provide facilities like street lights and public toilets and to effectively manage garbage that attracts stray dogs was one. Sensitization of the police force was another priority to aid in mob control during leopard emergencies. Workshops were also held for the media to restrict sensationalism. With their reach, journalists played a crucial role in helping people understand leopards by disseminating scientifically backed information. The whole journey from sensational to sensibility has been a long one. There was this program that started Mumbai Curse for SGNP. That is somewhere that changed the whole way of, of reportage. Forest Department became accessible to the media. Immediately, the level of sensationalism dropped. Fourth activity was to engage a wide range of public through awareness sessions on do's and don'ts during leopard sightings to prevent any mishaps. What we are trying to do is go ahead and meet these people before an incident, speak to them and tell them this could happen in the future. To avoid that from happening, what can you do? Many residents now accept leopards as neighbors. They take active precautions to reduce risk for themselves and advocate for others to do the same. जितने मौत है रोड एक्सीडेंट में हुई है वो लेपर्ड में अटैक में ऐसा कुछ भी नहीं हुआ है लेपर्ड आए तो कोई भी घबरा मत जाइए उसको उसके राह से जाने दीजिए उसको डिस्टर्ब मत कीजिए उसको वहाँ पे शोर मत मत जाइए सिर्फ वहाँ से हट जाइए। With the residents being sensitized by the project, no leopards have been captured in Mumbai since 2013. And when left alone, leopards, following their natural instinct, avoid people. No attacks on humans have been reported in the last two years in and around SGNP, as against up to 30 attacks a year between 2003 and 2005. Now the situation is gradually changing, the mindset is gradually changing, it's a big achievement. Mumbai has come a long way from experiencing severe conflicts to finding solution for peaceful coexistence. This was possible because general citizens were part of it realizing the values the park adds in their urban lives. In this ecosystem where we are staying, if the wildlife goes away, our existence will also be threatened. Thankfully, an increasing number of citizens are now working towards positive change. This may be about saving India's natural heritage, but interconnected as we all are, it begins with saving one life. One of the rescue department guys uh, told me a very good statement. He thinks, sir, you are doing such a good job. You can only save one child's life. So, your goal is to be successful. Hai, wo hai. Wo hai. Wo hai. Wo hai. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's my last slide, but it's an important slide because wild animals cannot understand what we are saying, what we want them to do, but people do. And therefore, it's so important that we engage and have the people as partners, whoever they are, maybe tea planters, tea plantation workers, media, veterinarians, citizens, students, Everybody matters.
and people matter much more than the animal in such issues of human wildlife interactions. Thank you. We have now time for the Q&A. Vidya, if you could have you over here. We have 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> about the dogs that were preyed on by the leopards, uh, were these stray dogs or people's pets? And if they were pets, how did the population react to that? And is there a very large stray dog population in the city that uh, might be some help for the Sri Lanka stray dogs? Yeah, um, so in the urban landscape, these are the free roaming dogs and less owned, but in the rural landscape, they are uh, people's dogs to a large extent. If you go to the towns where there is, you know, a lot of trash, then you do get free uh, ranging dogs. But I think, uh, you know, rural India, they don't, uh, I mean, they, they miss the animal and they take care of the animal, but it is not as, uh, I don't know how to put it in a nicer way, but it's not as important as sometimes it is in a urban landscape where the dog is part of almost a family member. So they do uh, miss it, but they also say, I mean, the leopard had to feed itself and its cubs, so it had to take it, so it's more complex than that, I think. I don't know if it helped. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Atreya. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Atreya, I'm here. Oh, here. Oh, yeah. Here. I have a question. Uh, in uh, Sri Lankan context, uh, related to what uh, uh, Dr. Fernando has asked, uh, what happened uh, in our context, uh, uh, if a dog or a livestock get attacked, there will be few specialist uh, snares people who put snares would come into the picture and uh, the intensity of uh, putting snares around these areas uh, go, uh, go up and uh, snaring in at least in my experience in the areas that I operate uh, is a huge issue because you can have a population of concerned citizens and one or two people who are specialized hunters uh, who would come into the picture so wouldn't that a problem in uh, Mumbai no because uh uh, especially snaring, no, in human-dominated landscapes is very, very rare because there are so many people, so many livestock that uh, it'll be dangerous to set up a snare because more than the leopard or wildlife, people and livestock will get caught. So that's the reason why really high density of people actually help sometimes. Yeah. But they do snare at the edges of the forest and in low, like, you know, for game. Yeah, uh, that's illegal, though. So, uh, and we have, uh, uh, like, enforcement authorities take care of that. Yeah. Uh, yes, this is in reference to the developing infrastructure, especially in a country like Sri Lanka. Uh, we are working towards economic growth. So, one of the points which you highlighted was how you prevented leopards from getting hit by road accidents. Can you elaborate on that? Because it's an interesting topic. Yeah, uh, so like now India has started putting into place uh, mitigation measures like uh, over bridges and underpasses uh, for the highways. But uh, we already had a huge network of those before we realized that it could be a problem. But many, now many of the new roads that are coming up have uh, either a green bridge or an underpass for animals to go through. So that is why that particular road was coming up for expansion. So that's why the forest department wanted to know where do the animals cross? Because it's good to know then that you, then you can target the 
overpasses and underbridges in those areas then? Good question. Okay, I guess I explained everything clearly enough. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Just a quick wrap up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vidya, for coming all the way to Sri Lanka and again giving us your input and having a whole week of working uh, in Sri Lanka with uh, the regional plantation community, uh, the school kids, uh, the Department of Wildlife. So thank you for your support and we, we will be looking at you to get more support in the future as well. Uh, really quickly, uh, this lecture series would not happen if not for Nations Trust Bank. So we thank them for their efforts and all the support they have been in the last four or five years. And specifically for Dr. Vidya's trip to Sri Lanka, we'd like to thank uh, Jetwing Hotels and Dilmati. Thank you, have a good evening.